About one in 25 people in the United States will have gout at some point in their life. It is often severely painful and can come on suddenly with the tax kind of out of nowhere. So what can be done about it? Hi, I'm the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this is The Exam Room Live. Thanks for joining us and raising your health IQ. Severe joint pain, redness, tender joints, none of it sounds like a whole lot of fun, but it is the reality for people who are living with gout. So today we're going to be learning what causes gout, how much diet plays a role in that, what foods may be contributing, but then on the flip side, the foods that may help relieve a lot of gout's painful symptoms as well. And joining us with that insight is the author of Your Body in Balance, Dr. Neil Barnard is here with us. And we're also going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag, talking about some other things beyond just gout questions that you all have sent into the doctor's mailbag. We have questions about onions and cholesterol. We've got walnuts and omega-3s and maybe your question as well. So if there's something you would like to ask Dr. Barnard, post that in the comments or in the chat, or you can send them to me anytime on Twitter or Instagram at Chuck Carroll WLC. And we will get to as many as we possibly can here on the show today. And with that, let's welcome Dr. Neil Barnard to the exam room live. Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you, Chuck. I'm really surprised that we have not really talked too in depth about gout yet on the show. When I was doing some research and I was like, well, what are the health topics that we haven't hit on? We've been doing the show for five years now. There aren't a whole heck of a lot that we haven't. Gout was one of them. And if you go on Google and you look at how many people are actually searching for gout relief, it is an astronomical number. Is this really one of those conditions that kind of flies under the radar a lot of times? Yeah, it is. However, it's something that once you have had it, you will never forget it. Um, it is a painful condition, and uh, it's a it's a great thing to, for, to talk about here because foods make a difference. Is it just food that is the cause of gout, or are there multiple factors at play here? Uh, there are multiple factors factors at play, but here's what happens: you go to the emergency room and you say, "I just I th I thought maybe I had an insect bite. I don't know what it was, but my joints are hurting more and more and more." And for some reason, one joint in particular is often affected, and it's the big toe. And so uh, you uh, see the doctor, and they they will diagnose gout. And on the way toward doing this, what they do is they take a needle put it into the big toe in the, the joint there, and they pull out crystals. These are uric acid crystals. And what has happened is that uric acid is something in your body, uh, but for some people, those crystals are building up in the joint and it's, it, uh, it, it's just terribly, terribly painful. And so you're gonna be on medications and so forth. And the doctor will talk to you about diet to try to make it stop from coming back. That doesn't sound like a lot of fun. You go there, you're already in pain, and you stick a needle in the toe. I mean, that just sounds 10 times more painful than what you already have going on. Um, yes, it's it's important. It's part of the diagnosis. It's done carefully and pretty much pain-free, really. And other blood tests uh, or blood tests are going to be part of it as well. And what doctors are thinking about is that uric acid has built up in the joints. The reason that happened is it comes from what are called purines. Purines are in foods, you need them. Your body uses them to make DNA, among other things. And normally your body has a way of getting rid of them, but for some people, due to dehydration, kidney problems, other reasons, the uric acid is building up and then it just deposits where you do not want it. And that's in your joints. I'm glad that you brought up food because that's where a lot of our questions today begin. Uh, let's start with Rachel. Rachel is wondering, what are the foods that are most likely to cause gout? Well, they're ones that you want to avoid anyway. Um, uh, first of all, meats, uh, red meat, other meats too, and also the uh, organ meats like liver. These are most tightly uh, linked to, to gout, so you really want to avoid those. And all right, flip side then, what are the foods that are most likely to help alleviate a lot of the pain somebody might be experiencing? This is a little bit of a surprise. Um, if you go online and you look up which foods have purines so that I'm gonna limit them or avoid them, among these foods are, are beans or lentils. However, when researchers have tracked people who eat a lot of beans and lentils, it turns out that those foods actually help protect against 
gout. We don't know exactly why that is, but it turns out that the plant foods are part of the solution. They reduce the risk of gout. The animal products, just the opposite. Is it uh, that a plant-based diet overall, again, we've talked about this in the past, is anti-inflammatory. You're talking about an inflamed toe. I mean, I would think that generally speaking, a lot of these anti-inflammatory foods are really going to be beneficial to somebody who's suffering at this point. It certainly works out that way. Yes. Um, there, and there are any number of any number of reasons why plant-based foods might be beneficial. Um, they have exactly the effect that you mentioned, Chuck. They, they fight inflammation. They also help people to knock off an unwanted weight. And when your weight comes down, uh, you're at less risk for gout as well. What about fat here? Um, you know, Christine is wondering whether diet is the biggest predictor of gout. And here in America, obviously the standard American diet is just full of fat. So if somebody's loading up on things like cheeseburgers, French fries, potato chips as a snack, pizza for dinner, all of that stuff, are they really driving themselves toward an increased likelihood of gout? They're driving themselves towards all kinds of problems, cardiovascular problems, a higher risk of cancer, weight problems, diabetes. But with regard to gout, it looks like it's this balance between the purines coming in and there I'm going to indict meats and the organ meats in particular, and your ability to get rid of them. And so when people are dehydrated, uh, when they're really overweight, uh, uh, these, or if their kidneys are not really doing their job very well, then that's just going to set you up for gout. You know, it's funny, uh, the organ meat, I was having a conversation with a neighbor of mine who was very excited because she was going to have liver for dinner one night last week. And she was swearing up one side and down the other about the health properties of liver, just how good it was for you. And, you know, how she had learned about this as a little girl from her mom many years ago at this point. Um, and I just, I, I couldn't move her off of that. You know, she's just like, there's so much iron in there. It's there's so many nutrients in the liver. And yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. Like if somebody's really kind of dug in on something like that, what might we be able to say to them to help move that needle? Especially if it's somebody in our own lives who we care about and we have their best interest at heart. Well, that really was what everybody believed. And back in the 1950s, early 60s, they would sell a product, Geritol, that had more iron than a whole pound of calf's liver. And the idea was that liver was this ideal food because it, it did what she said. It's got a huge amount of iron. We thought the more, the better. Were we wrong? We started to discover that people who have too much iron in their blood are at much higher risk for heart disease than we learned they're at higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so you want a little bit of iron, not too much. And the same is true with many other things. You need a little bit of copper in your diet, not too much. And meat puts you in the too much category. So no, there, there is almost no food worse than liver. It's got too much iron, a, an overly absorbable form of iron that's going to give you problems. It's got a boatload of cholesterol, lots of saturated fat. It's uh, no the, one of the first things that should be in the trash can. What about uh, the processed meats here? We're talking about organ meats, but you, I mean, you know, processed meats, deli meats, that's <laughs> those are hot items here. So what do we know about their connection here specifically with gout? Yeah, exactly. Um, they are meats. And what you do to make it a processed meat is you cure it, you smoke it, you preserve it in various other ways to change the flavor or change the, the shelf life of, of it, basically. That does not make it any healthier. It is still going to be a contributor to gout, just like it was when it was unprocessed. And now that it's gone through the processing, it's a much higher contributor to colorectal cancer and other forms of cancer. So all, all of these things are things we have sort of stumbled in into. And uh, they used to be sort of only special occasion foods. Now they are everyday foods for people. And that's why we see epidemics of gout and other meat related diseases. We haven't talked about dairy yet in this context. Jacob is wondering whether milk and cheese may be a contributor to gout as well. Uh, surprisingly, probably not. Um, in fact, some studies have suggested a slight reduction in risk with dairy. So dairy has all kinds of other things that are not good about it. It's the number one source of bad fat in the diet, but probably not a gout contributor. Interesting question here from Mike, who's wondering why is it that men seem to be more at risk for gout than women? 
uh, this has been something we've observed all along, and I don't think anybody really knows the reason for it. Is it that they're big meat eaters? Is it that their kidneys are uh, having more trouble getting rid of that uric acid? We don't really know the answer to that, but what you said is there. Now, now it's not a dramatic excess risk that we see among men, but you do see the preponderance of, of cases are men. You know, it's it's funny that um, I'm, I'm thinking to somebody close to me um, who is uh, uh, just loves, loves, loves some liver. And uh, I didn't realize that they had gout until earlier this year. Uh, this person definitely enjoys the standard American diet, but liver is uh, on their menu quite often. And quite often, it's fried liver at that. Um, so when you take something like liver that's already going to put you at risk, and then you fry it on top of that, does adding the oil, adding a little bit more fat make it you know, even worse for you in terms of gout risk? It wouldn't present any problem at all if you just do one simple thing. When it comes out of the fry pan, cut it up into really small shreds and then put it on a small plate, put it on the floor and call your cat over to eat it. Because your cat, Chuck, your cat is a carnivore. Your cat's going to do fine with it, but you are a primate and you are not going to do well if you try and try to eat um, animal, par animal parts. Uh, you know, that's, that's, those are the foods that carnivores have come to terms with and we still do really badly with them. Okay. Uh, really quick, let's put a bow on this. Other than uh, really changing up your diet, gravitating toward that more plant-based diet, is there anything else that somebody might try other than medication that could also help bring some relief? Yeah. Uh, one other thing, it's good to limit or avoid alcohol. And we've talked about that for all kinds of other reasons, but this is another one. For whatever reason, alcohol seems to increase the risk of gout. People who, who, uh, push the bottle away, uh, either completely or, or more than they were before, are going to reduce their risk. Uh, weight loss, by any means, makes gout less likely to occur. And of course, when a person's on a plant-based diet, you've got the dietary quality that's going to help prevent it. And as the weight loss kicks in, that makes the risk even lower. All right, let's go ahead and open up the doctor's mailbag and bounce around a little bit. We've got uh, kind of a grab bag happening here today. Uh, we'll start with James. Uh, it is fall as we uh, go live here today, and it is still apple season. James is wondering, though, about apple cider vinegar and whether that's a good thing to use in conjunction with a plant-based diet for their health. You know, apple cider vinegar is one of these products that um, – it, it really sounds very healthful and people have been promoting it for all kinds of things. I have to say, I, I am not really convinced by the science um, regarding apple cider vinegar. However, I will say this. If you are a salad dressing person and you're putting Thousand Island and creamy dressings all over your salad, if you set them aside, this is the time when apple cider vinegar is going to shine because you can put that on your salad. It gives it that little zip, that little bit of tang, but it doesn't have any fat. It gives, it's a nice taste. And you can, you can do this also with cooked green vegetables like broccoli or kale or collard greens. Uh, it will have a really nice flavor and it doesn't have to be apple cider vinegar, balsamic vinegar. Uh, even a squirt of lemon juice has that same kind of uh, vinegary effect. Broccoli. I'm, I'm sure that Hamid is wondering about that with this question. Uh, Hamid is wondering whether it matters if we eat plant foods raw versus cooked. Ah, great question. Um, you'd have to say that raw foods are what we evolved with. You know, we didn't evolve with sterno and gas stoves and things, so raw has got to be better. However, here's the issue. Uh, we don't really know which foods those were that were around here a few million years ago. And there are some foods that we know uh, we can eat raw and others we're not so sure about. So bottom line, there are some foods that must be cooked. That's obvious for beans, uh, legumes in general, beans, peas, lentils. Uh, with the cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, you're going to do better if they are cooked. By better, I mean they're going to be much more digestible. They're not going to be causing the digestive uh, problem so much. Grains obviously have to be cooked, but fruits don't need to cook them. The lettuce and the other salad greens, you don't need to cook those. Same with tomatoes. And, and frankly, the more these uncooked plants come into your life, the better. When it comes to something like broccoli, what what is 
the point to which you want to cook it because we do from time to time have people who express concern in the chat room the exam room you say well look you know i want to maximize the nutrients from each vegetable if i put it in the microwave or if i cook it too long on the stove i feel like i'm losing out on a lot of potential nutrients what's the sweet spot there the sweet spot is something you're going to find about three hours after you ate it. Um, if, if, you know, I'm serious. If you are, if you have no trouble with your digestion, if the broccoli you ate went, was fine, you didn't get gassiness, great. But for some people, in the same way that beans can cause great gassiness, cruciferous vegetables can too if they weren't cooked. So if you're in kind of an irritable bowel phase of your life, now is a good time for you to really cook it like crazy. Cook, cook it till it's soft. And if you're at a restaurant, the chef, the, the chef will not want to do it. They'll say, no, I can't just cook it like crazy. If you do, it's more digestible. And that's true for cauliflower and, and most of the other crucif uh, cruciferous vegetables as well. All right, let's uh, switch gears here. We have a couple of holdovers from the nut Q&A that we did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we will start with one from Jared, who wants to know what your thoughts are, Dr. Barnard, on walnuts and omega-3s. Jared says, uh, I'm 50, and I'm worried that I'm just not getting enough omega-3s eating a plant-based diet. Yeah, well, walnuts are great, and they do have uh, omega-3 in them, and they have vitamin E in them as well. And that's one of the great things about nuts. Generally speaking, we're a little bit nervous about nuts for people who are trying to lose weight or control diabetes or other things because they are so fatty. But if a person isn't really trying to lose weight and they have some nuts about an ounce a day or so, they're going to get vitamin E, they will get omega-3. Now, but let, let me tackle the other part of your question. You said, I'm nervous. I don't know if I'm getting enough omega-3. Here's what you can do. Um, First of all, don't rush to the fish aisle and get some salmon thinking I need the omega-3. You can test it. There are companies like uh, Omega Quant is one of them. You go on their website, you pay them something like 50 bucks. They'll send you a card. You put a drop of blood on the card, you mail it back, and they'll do a test. And they'll you'll get a, your results uh, a little while later telling you if you're low or not. If you are low, then you can add more omega-3 rich foods or you can go to the store or online and get an EPA, DHA, vegan supplement. Uh, these were not so common, maybe 10 years ago, they're everywhere now. And then you can, can supplement for a while and you can test again. So, so you could take the guesswork out of it. The reason that I suggest doing that is people really do not know if supplementation and really pushing up your EPA, DHA levels is safe. Here are, the, here are the issues. We've learned a long time ago that people whose blood levels in uh, DHA in particular, people whose blood levels were low, were at higher risk for Alzheimer's. That made everybody want to go high. We then discovered that men with high levels of DHA were at higher risk of prostate cancer. And at first we thought this is just a, a, an artifact of the research. It's been found so consistently that we now believe it. And so what that means is you want to be kind of like we were saying before, you want to be in the sweet spot for DHA, not too little, but also not too much. And that's why I encourage people to get tested. You can test yourself, very easy to do, and then you can take action if you want to. You know, and that opens the door for this part of the conversation. So I feel like we should walk through it because if we get these questions about, I'm worried I'm not getting enough of this nutrient or this vitamin. And obviously nine times out of 10, we're talking about a plant-based diet here on the show, but what about people who aren't eating a plant-based diet? Aren't they at just a, at just as high of a risk of having various vitamin or nutrient deficiencies as somebody who is eating a plant-based diet, if not even at greater risk in a lot of cases? You said it, Chuck. Uh, you can actually do diet quality assessments. You bring in research volunteers. You either test their current diet or you ask them to begin a new diet. And then what you do is you track everything they eat while they are following the dietary pattern in question. And what we find over and over and over again is that people who are on a meaty diet, the, the diet they grew up on, the diet they're eating before they came into your research study, that is much uh, more likely to be low in important nutrients compared to a vegan diet and more likely to be high in things you don't want. So what I'm saying is that the dietary quality of a meaty diet is really very poor. What's, what's the problem with it? Your body needs fiber. There's not much 
I mean, there's no fiber in animal products at all. Your body needs healthy, complex carbohydrates for energy. That's not in an animal-based diet. You're missing that. Your body needs vitamin C. It's an antioxidant. It's not in meat. It just isn't there at all. So people tend to run low and they run low in other things like folate and a, a whole raft of things. They then come into your research study. They start a plant-based diet. They're eating their vegetables. They're eating their fruits, their whole grains and beans, and no surprise. They're getting fiber. They're getting healthy, complex carbs. They're getting lots of vitamin C. They're getting folate. They're getting many more things the dietary quality improves. And then somebody says, well, gee, you're vegan. Aren't you running low on things? The fact is your diet is far better than it was before. You still need to plan. Make sure you're getting all four groups, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and the bean group or the legume group. Don't forget your vitamin B12. You put those together, you are a long way toward a really, really, really healthy diet. Yeah. And you want to know something kind of funny. One of my favorite episodes that we've done on the show was one that we called Overfed, Undernourished. And that really got me to think about my old diet. When I was still eating 10,000 calories a day, I was still coming up well short of my uh, requirements in a lot of different areas in terms of, you know, this or that uh, vitamin or nutrient, even though I'm eating just this insane volume of food, I'm still coming up short because of the dietary choices that I'm making. And so I say that to say this, if you are in fact nervous, I can only speak from experience that you're not going to be getting what you need on a plant-based diet. I'm eating one fifth of the calories here and my nutrients are through the roof. So that's all I have to say about that. I'm off of my soapbox and we're going to pick up another question. <laughs> another que I mean, isn't that, that kind of crazy? You can eat 10,000 calories a day and still come up short in a lot of areas. Yeah. And, and what you're saying, Chuck, is so important. And it's important for another reason, too. Not everything that's important to you, not everything that contributes to health is an identified vitamin. For example, uh, there are isoflavones in soy products that reduce the risk of breast cancer, but there isn't any recommended daily allowance of isoflavones. Meat eaters aren't getting them. Um, so the point is when you're on a plant-based diet, yes, you get the nutrients we know are important. Yes, you avoid the things you want to avoid, but you're also getting the things that we are only just now learning about. Um, the isoflavones are one, sulforaphane in, in broccoli is another. These are all things that where we're starting to understand, okay, that's why vegetables reduce cancer risk. That's why fruits can reduce the risk of stroke and cardiovascular disease and things like that. It's all the other parts of them that we didn't know were there before. All right, let's grab a couple of more nut questions here. Uh, Pete wants to know whether fat from nuts can clog our arteries just like animal fat. Good question. The answer is no. Uh, it's not going to really, for the most part. Nuts have are, the nuts are pretty low in saturated fat. Now they're not zero, um, so you don't want to be going crazy with nuts. And if it's something like a nut butter, sometimes they added palm oil or other kinds of oils to the jar to make it creamy, and those can be part of the problem. But the nut itself, not really so much a contributor. That said, I still encourage people to be modest with nuts because they are so fatty, that means they're really high in calories and the fat is gonna cause all kinds of other issues, which we've talked about for a person who's trying to reverse diabetes, person who's trying to lose weight, uh, somebody who's dealing with menstrual pain, menop menopausal symptoms. For whatever reason, we find consistently that when you get away from those really oily foods, they often do better. And nuts, unfortunately, are in that category. You mentioned adding oil to uh, nut butter, but what about the natural peanut butter? Andrew has a pretty good question here. Uh, you ever open up a jar of peanut butter that's natural and you see that big layer of oil on top? Andrew is wondering whether he should be dumping that out and saving some fat and calories there. Yes, <laughs> that's a good <laughs> idea. Your instinct is exactly right. Pour it off. You don't need it. There you go. Uh, okay, uh, let's take a question from Tina. I, I, did not know that there was even a, a rumor out there that there's a correlation between onions and cholesterol. Tina's wondering whether, in fact, they can help to lower cholesterol. You know, this is a really interesting story, or at least to me, an interesting story. Uh, there's a whole group called Allium Vegetables, A-L-I-U-M, -I -I uh, vegetables. 
a double L I U M vegetables. Uh, that's onions, garlic, uh, scallions, uh, th th that whole um, group of just really savory vegetables we love to use in cooking. And they are reputed to have many health benefits. Lowering cholesterol was one of them. So garlic was kind of the first to get tested. And I have to say, I have not found it very convincing that garlic was really going to lower cholesterol. However, onions were the next up. And there was a review that came out last year, I would say 2021, that looked at a number of different studies, put them all together in a meta-analysis. And it is true that for some reason, people who eat the most onions have about, oh, I don't know, six or seven points lower uh, bad cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, compared to people avoiding uh, the onions. We don't know the reason for it. At least I haven't been able to tease apart what it is in that onion that's really doing it, but they do seem to work. Is that to say that the onion you put on top of your cheeseburger is going to offset all of the cholesterol that it has? <laughs> and, and right, just as ridiculous as that is, you, I could just hear somebody saying liver and onions. Uh, uh the, the onions will not undo the effect of the liver. No, you, yeah, you got to bring the onions into your diet, but have them flavor up healthful foods. All right. Uh, Cyan says, uh, thanks for the nutrient talk, gentlemen. Uh, but you're talking about adults. I have a teenager that I'm wondering about. Is it possible for a teenager to be vegan and remain healthy without requiring any supplements? A vegan diet is the greatest gift that a kid can have because all the other kids in the school who are not yet vegan, they're at high risk for things that are going to hit them in 10, 15, 20 years. I'm talking about weight they don't want a high cholesterol level that leads them to be on a statin, a uh, high blood sugar that leads to diabetes. They don't want any of that stuff. Um, so the health risks of an omnivorous diet are terrible, but a vegan diet does have to be planned. And here are the rules. Four groups, fruits, kids will eat fruit. If it's around, they're going to eat that. Vegetables, if they are prepared the right way, and they're the ones kids like, they'll eat those too. Grains, beans, fruits, vegetables, grains, and beans. And do add a vitamin B12 supplement. This is not optional. The child does need it. But if, they'll, if they're allergic to the idea of, gee, do I have to take a B12 supplement? Call it Flintstones. You know, the, the, the children's vitamins have B12 in them. They need that for healthy nerves and healthy blood. And uh, okay, Parker here was wondering about a specific nutrient. I don't think that we talk a whole lot about manganese on the show. So Parker is wondering about excess manganese and whether that can be an issue on a plant-based diet. He says he tracks everything that he eats and quite frequently his manganese levels are off the charts. Is there any risk for somebody that's getting more than they may need? Um, yeah, there are risks from excess mangan manganese, but probably not from food sources. Um, if you do see different food sources listed, and if you're eating anything like a normal plant-based diet, you're going to be fine. Where people run into trouble is for some reason, they were taking some supplement or some, something like that where the manganese just um, was off the scale. Uh, that's really very unusual. Uh, once in a while, you'll find uh, a product grown on soil that was had almost toxic levels of some element in it like manganese. So it would get into the corn and whatever, but that's really pretty rare. So if you're eating a plant-based diet, um, the manganese level will vary from one plant to another, and it'll vary depending on the soil it was grown on. But you're not going to run into, into a problem with manganese in, in that case, unless you're for some reason supplementing it, which you should not be doing. All right. You know, let's talk about hummus here really quickly, Dr. Barnard. We are, in fact, just bouncing all over the place. But some of the world's best tasting hummus contains tahini. And Lindsay is worried about that. Lindsay is wondering whether you should limit the amount of tahini that is in your diet. Yeah, tahini, all it is, it's sesame seeds. You know, you puree them and they are delicious. The sesame seeds on your salad are delicious. And they and when they turn into hummus, they're delicious too. But a little bit goes a long way. And try this out. Take your favorite hummus recipe. And before you throw it into your food processor and blend it down and make hummus, cut the amount of tahini in half or even a quarter. And what you'll discover is you've just really reduced the fat content. You've reduced the, the calories and then taste it. And you'll discover it's still just really delicious. Uh, a lot of brands to appeal to people's kind of fatty taste, throw in extra tahini and it almost is becoming like peanut butter. And then they throw in some oil on top of that. And you discover that your tastes will prefer the lighter taste of 
give it a try and you'll, you'll see what I mean. Now, let's see if we can grab a few more here uh, pretty quickly with the time that we have remaining. Uh, let's pivot over to selenium. Christine is wondering what are some good selenium sources for people who have a nut and grain allergy? You know, what you might be thinking of is the Brazil nuts big um, elevator speech for itself is I've got more selenium than just about any other food. And that is true. However, selenium, like many other nutrients, it's something you need a little bit of. You, you need it because selenium plays a role in antioxidants in your body. But you don't need a huge amount of it. It's like other things can be toxic. So selenium levels, like manganese that we were talking about earlier, selenium is in the soil. The crops grow out of the soil and they carry some selenium with it. And if you eat a variety of plant foods, you're going to get the selenium you need. This is one of the things I suggest people not supplement. Uh, get it from foods because you want it. You, you don't want to go above that sweet spot. All right. Uh, a lot of people have a sweet tooth here, but they're looking for the healthiest possible way to indulge it. To that end, Dana is wondering whether maple syrup is okay. Oh, sure. Yeah, maple syrup is fine. Uh, maple syrup, actually, the we sent it to a laboratory. The main sugar in it is very much like table sugar. It's sucrose and your body digests it perfectly fine. And, and surprisingly enough, you bring in some um, uh, research volunteers and you give them a measured dose of maple syrup. You would think, oh, their blood sugar is going to shoot up. It, it doesn't really. It's fairly gentle on your uh, blood sugar. So maple syrup is fine. I, what I suggest you do is put it on some vegan French toast with vegan sausage or, or vegan bacon instead of what most people do, which is they put the maple syrup on top of something really unhealthy with lots of other breakfast items that are equally unhealthy. But the maple syrup itself, not going to hurt you. You know what I didn't realize is that a lot of the syrups that are sold in the store don't even have actual syrup in there, right? So if you see something that's labeled pancake syrup, before you put that in your shopping cart, I would recommend flipping it over and take a look at what's actually in that bottle. Uh, you would be hard pressed to find actual maple syrup in there. Did you, were you familiar with that before you really got ingrained in nutrition? Did you know yeah. that like, it's just wild? It's a question of economics. Um, sometimes there'll be no maple syrup in it at all, or there'll be just a little bit and the rest will be some other kind of, of plant-based syrup. That doesn't mean they're terribly unhealthy, uh, but the, the quality is not the same. All right. Uh, speaking of just a little bit, Dana, a follow-up question here, uh, wants to know whether it's still okay to have one glass of wine per week. We talk about the, the risks of alcohol. You mentioned it earlier when we were talking about gout. Obviously, Dr. Christy Funk last month with uh, breast cancer, really talking about limiting the alcohol here. But if it's just one glass of week, is there some risk that still exists? It's hard to say that at that level, there's going to be any detectable risk at all. Um, but the, the thrust of the question is right, that alcohol contributes to many forms of cancer. Breast cancer is the best known, but many other forms of cancer, like colorectal cancer, pancreatic cancer, many others are linked to alcohol. It's dose related. So the more you drink, the higher your risk. And so that typically gets people saying, oh, have less than one per day. What they really mean is, is have it be modest and intermittent. But if a person is actually having only one glass per week, and it's not a huge glass, um, it's pretty, it's really pretty hard to say that there would be a detectable risk uh, from that. I'm, I'm not suggesting that it, there's any benefit from it either, because I, I'm uh, convinced that, that there really probably isn't. Uh, but the risk at, le at that level would be negligible. Uh, the last question to me is actually probably the most interesting that we have here on the show today. It comes to us from an exam roommate by the name of Vicky, who wrote in and said that she lives in an area where the air quality is just atrocious. And she's wondering whether a plant-based diet can help counter a lot of the ill effects that come with that unhealthy air. Interesting question. Um, some of the research on this started with a particular kind of unhealthy air, that's cigarette smoke. A person smoking a cigarette and they're bringing in the atmosphere, but it, along with it, they bring lots of carcinogens. And so researchers started realizing that whether we smoke or don't smoke, we are bringing in carcinogens into our body and the body has ways of getting what are called phase two enzymes 
that cap that help capture carcinogens and carry them out of your body. Broccoli, amazingly enough, causes your liver to react by making much more of these phase two enzymes. And the credit goes to something called sulforaphane. So the way it works is you eat some broccoli today, a, a normal serving, a good generous serving, but not a huge amount. And by tomorrow, your body is making more sulforaphane. So now you're inhaling the air from your polluted city and it's getting the pollutants are getting to your bloodstream. The sulf sulforaphane causes your body to make phase two enzymes. They grab those pollutants, they carry them out of your body. Don't inhale toxins, do not smoke, but you're going to inhale bad things no matter what. And so if your diet is rich in broccoli, you're going to be better protected. And the good news is this is true, pretty much true of all of the cruciferous vegetables. So that's broccoli, cauliflower, kale, cabbage, th that whole group has this sulforaphane boosting, uh, this, it has the sulforaphane that has this phase two enzyme boosting effect and it's going to help protect you. All right. If we did not get to your question today, have no fear. We will save it and do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. So keep on posting them in the comments or in the chat. And Dr. Barnard, uh, before we wrap up today, just a quick thank you again to the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund for making today's episode of the Exam Room Live possible. You know, the Gregory J. Ryder Memorial Fund supports organizations just like the Physicians Committee that carry on Greg's love for animals. And they're doing it by promoting a plant-based diet and working to and animal abuse while emphasizing programs that promote systemic change and also benefit people. You can visit them online, and I highly encourage you to do this. Visit them online right now at uh, gregoryriderfund.org. That's Gregory Rider spelled R E I. T-E-R fund.org. You see that right there on the screen. And, you know, every time I see Greg's smiling face here on the show, I think to all of the stories that Allison has told me and all of the good that Greg did in this world in the, in the short time that he was actually here to help, um, his legacy really does carry on in such a tremendous way. And that, that grit of datitude is, is really. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, Greg had such a heart for animals and Allison has carried that on so beautifully. So. Thank you for making this possible. Absolutely. And thank you uh, very much for being here today, Dr. Barnard. Appreciate your wisdom as always, my friend. Thank you, Chuck. And to the crew behind the scenes that made the magic happen today, thank you as well. And to you, Exam Roomies, thanks for raising your health IQ with us and spending a little time uh, this afternoon with us as well. And for everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again soon. But until then, keep it plant-based. <laughs>